want to welcome everybody on the OPN channel who's coming to be with us tonight. We're honored and humbled to have Billy Livesley here um, to speak to us about his experience as an activist and an occupier. Um, we're going to do our usual little Q&A. Um, Sue's going to be the facilitator tonight. And while she's putting up that information, I just want to speak to something that's a little bit um, of a tragedy that we can all help. Um, our good friend, Natty Mom, who's been a longtime mod and activist and supporter of OWS, had a kind of a devastating evening yesterday. Uh, she is in Flint, Michigan. She is currently the live stream uh, channel Occupy Earth, one of their moderators. But um, Flint had a lot of heavy flooding last night, and Lippy and her family were flooded out. So we want to do whatever we can to support her. They lost, um, she and her son lost all their belongings. And um, there's a WePay account set up where we can all contribute to help them out any way possible. Sue's going to put out those uh, links, and we'll repeat that again at the end of the interview. If you have further questions, you can also just check with us, you know, email any one of us, or check on Occupy Earth. And, uh, you know, we'll all band together and help out as we can. So I just wanted to, to get that message out. And now, you know, we send you love, Nettie. We're sorry for your tragedy and your loss, but hopefully the sun will come up and brighter things will happen. Um, we're all going to do what we can to help out. Okay, with that, we're going to turn to Billy, and I'm going to just read just a smidge of his bio, which is pretty impressive. Um, Billy's been an active member of Occupy Wall Street since day one. He uh, lived in Liberty and has become involved with outreach, safer spaces, and direct action. He is a tireless and selfless activist and has a long background of activism, and we're fortunate to have him here. So, Billy, that's my little introduction. If you want to launch right in and tell us a little bit more about yourself, uh, your, your name, your nick. Um, any contact information you wish to share, we'd love to hear that sure. and maybe lead into how you first became involved with Occupy. Well, I mean, I, I don't know where to begin. I, I grew up in, in, in the South, and so I think that sort of frames the way I look at the world. I grew up in, in, in Tampa, Florida, and I, so I, I don't come to the, I don't come into things as a traditional sort of liberal from the Upper West Side of Manhattan or the, or the, or San Francisco or, or any of the traditional like left, lefty spots in this country. I grew up in a, in one of those communities that had a church on every corner and in, in many ways, suburban Hillsborough County is the buckle of the Bible belt. So I, I don't come to it naturally. It wasn't part of my family's makeup. And so I, I came to it later on. Um, but it, it definitely resonates with me for personal reasons. Um, I, I grew up smart, but not, not really street smart. And so I had, I had a, a sense of re rebellion about me academically. And so since my family was conservative, I of course was liberal and, but it was all in my head. And I, I skipped two years of school. I graduated from high school. When I was 16 instead of 18. And, and, and I think had I not had to grow up really quickly, I never would have become a street activist. I was thrown out on the street when I was 16 because my fundamentalist Christian parents weren't particularly interested in having a gay son. So at 16, I had to grow up really quickly, and I discovered that being book smart is not the same as looking at the world from the street. And so I learned activism very young, and I was a young gay man in the 80s watching my contemporaries die out. There were so many people, so many funerals I went to for people in their 20s because of the, of the AIDS pandemic, really, that I began to look at the world differently and I got involved at the time I, when I left Florida, when I was thrown out of my house, I lived in Los Angeles for a while, and I became involved with ACT UP and that was my first introduction to really strident direct action. And I saw that the work that we did in facilitating 
just awareness, funding saved lives. So the fact that we put our bodies on the line and we went and took over the National Institute of Health and we went to the White House and threw ashes on the White House lawn and one of the all of all of those actions and all of those arrests led to the media not being able to deny that this epidemic, this pandemic existed. It got the Reagan administration to admit that AIDS existed. And I began to see that there was a direct correlation between building public support, direct action, and seeing results on the other end. And I think that wave of activism actually saved lives and got funding and forced funding and forced awareness and confronted the homophobia that existed around people dying and people not wanting to do anything about it. I think we have the clinical trials and the drugs and now, 25 years later, AIDS is not a huge problem in the United States if you have health insurance and can afford the expensive drugs that save your lives. But that research would not have been done without direct activism. And from there, I became an environmentalist and became, look, look at the global world situation. I was in the Peace Corps and my whole worldview changed and I became very cynical. And I think what led to Occupy for me was that I saw so many young people throw their heart, soul, passion, time, money into the Obama campaign and looking at Barack Obama, someone who was a community organizer in New York originally at Columbia and worked for NYPIRG before organizing in Chicago, and watching people really walk precincts and vote in record ways and, and the exhilaration and hope that came out of his election and see that we elected really just George Bush for a third term. Nothing changed in any fundamental way. And not because he's not a good person or didn't have, you know, I don't really fault him um, as much as I fault the system. And then I saw the ad in Adbusters, and I saw people organizing around what does it mean to occupy Wall Street. And for the first time, I thought, that's the real problem. The problem is not in Washington. The problem is not in a particular candidate's platform or a particular political party's platform. The problem is that you and I and everyone else in this country does not have access to our government. We don't have access to the decision-making powers because we don't have the checkbook that is necessary to write the check to gain access. And so Wall Street is the problem figuratively and realistically all over the country. Money money buys politics, and then the idea of occupying Wall Street and drawing attention to that problem seemed unique and interesting to me, and that's why I wanted to get involved. I went to some planning meetings and then thought it was odd that it was September 17th, which was a Saturday. We we're supposed to gather, but it's not even open on Saturday. We first, we thought we'd go to the to the federal plaza, which I guess the authorities had already thought, well, maybe they'll go there, so they had that boarded off before we even went. We were in the Wall Street area, which we got thrown out of after a little while, and sort of haphazardly wound up in Zuccotti Park, which we renamed Liberty Plaza. And the big direct action of day one was having a general assembly where we got to voice these concerns out loud, which felt very liberating, that the problem wasn't the Obama administration or the Bush administration, the problem was that a small percentage of people controlled the wealth, the power, and had all the access in this country. And that access was born out of greed gone crazy and capitalism gone wild. That's probably more than you wanted to know. No, no, we want to know everything. That's why we do these interviews. We're here to educate and inform. And um, I wanted to welcome viewers that are on uh, watching us on other channels. If uh, you guys are out there screen capping us, thank you for sharing our message. And this is... Billy, an activist and, and occupier from day one, and we're lucky to have him here. Um, I wanted to touch on something you said that, that I had never really considered or heard of before. Um, when you first went to New York to engage with Occupy, it sounded to me like you were indicating that Liberty Plaza was sort of an accidental occupation did it just happen to coalesce circumstantially around there is that accurate or was there originally was, a plan the short, it was on the short list of places that were considered for occupation but it was not the first choice by far and because people wanted to actually occupy wall street they wanted they looked at where the federal reserve was um and we were told very quickly on that day that you couldn't get to the federal reserve we were on Wall Street a little bit, but told you couldn't stay. And no one really knew what they wanted to do, but they knew, but it was Saturday and it was a lot of us who thought, well, Wall Street's not even open. So here we are clamoring around on a day talking to empty buildings. So it just seemed 
crazy. And but we had talked about consensus models and models of direct democracy prior to September 17th. So on that day, the best thought we had at that point was to get all these people who were gathered together and have a general assembly where we could voice our concerns and maybe make a plan from there. But we had no idea what it would grow into and no idea that, you know, that those of us gathered in, in, in Zuccotti, which we renamed Liberty Plaza that day, and and our jar of peanut butter and a loaf of bread was going to turn into a movement. We just thought we were confronting the real problem, and it felt exhilarating to do so. And apparently that, that alone resonated as more and more people started to come. And when you look at from September 17th to when we marched on the Brooklyn Bridge and, and the, the action in Times Square, you're talking a couple of weeks that it grew from a couple hundred to really a, a, a nationwide, worldwide movement. Right. Um, and it, the growth of it was phenomenal. I remember it in the early days, my interest was that um, you occupied Liberty, and from day one, this infrastructure started springing up. I mean, people were literally building a new reality in a village on the spot that was uh, based in something other than a profit motive. Could you tell us a little bit what those early days in Liberty were like? It was exhilar exhilarating. It was adrenaline sort of charging at the time because it was before I divide my time in Liberty. It's like pre and post tents. Like before the tents went up, I would say it was a 100% positive experience. We were forming the beginnings of working groups and media and people had their laptops and, and, and live stream and we started thinking about having this assembly every day where people could voice their concerns and what do we want to do with this and where do we want to go with it and just having speak outs and hearing people come from different points of view all having the same central problem being access and and corporate greed and we start then people who are concerned specifically with citizens united and corporate personhood and think tanks began which were my favorite thing in liberty because liberty where it's situated got a lot of tourists because you had to walk as you got off the subway or out of your cab if you were a tourist you would walk by all the people with sad looks on their faces trying to sell you thirty dollar commemorative books for the 9 11 memorial and so you'd walk past them for people trying to profit off a tragedy and then you'd look at the building of the new freedom tower and then you'd pass that and you'd be in liberty plaza and people would just sort of walk through on their way to be a tourist to wall street and get caught up in think tanks where you'd have a sign up saying we're talking now about racism and and this society we're talking about corporatocracy we're talking about education and i heard so many empowering amazing things i'll never forget one of the early ones there was a an african-american woman who sat down and it was sort of graphic what she said but it resonated with me she was talking about the difficulties of gaining trust in across the movement and she described her experience as an african-american woman as an activist that she said, you know, after a while, she said, if after a while, if you're being raped, you stop screaming. And then maybe eventually the rapist pulls out. And then once that happens, you might get up and make them a cup of coffee, but you sure don't trust them. And she described that as the way the movement is for a lot of African Americans in the city, that they realize things are better and they're not really being raped anymore by everybody else. But the trust isn't there and all the old issues have never been talked about out loud. And think tanks were a way to talk about those things out loud in a way where everyone was heard and everyone was on equal footing. And I remember sitting in another think tank looking at this man in a tie and a briefcase that was under the lunch hour working from somewhere in the financial district next to a homeless veteran. And they both had equal voice in this conversation because you couldn't buy your way into it and you couldn't influence the direction of the conversation based on who you were, how much money you had, the color of your skin, or the degree of your privilege. And that was an incredible experience, and that happened every day, every minute, and, and that kind of energy was crackling. You could feel it when you, when you walked into the park. And that was pretense, correct? Pretense, yes. Okay, and so you also said you divided it between pretense and post-tense. So let's hear the other side of that discussion. Um, when the tents went up, well, a lot of things began happening after a while. I mean, because at first, when at first the weather was warmer, 
And so and I would sleep in a sleeping bag or on top of a sleeping bag. It was a very mild fall uh, down around what we called the, the sacred circle. People would put um, it, imagery from very various religions or spiritualities and so they would write poems and put them down and I used to sleep around that circle and we called it the sacred tree. And there was no need for a, for, a, for a tent. But after a while, it started to get colder and, and the winds of October were, were howling. And we got a snowfall in October. One of the two snowfalls we got this entire winter, one of them was in October. And people started putting tents up. Now, as the indigent population and the homeless population discovered Zuccotti Park and discovered Occupy Wall Street and discovered you could come here and get a meal without having to sit through an hour and a half church service to get it, they began coming. And also there was a certain degree of the NYPD wanting this to all end or the city wanting it to end. And so there would bus people as they got out of jail at Rikers and send them down to, 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 to Liberty Plaza. They would find crazy homeless people all over the city and escort them to Liberty Plaza. So we started getting an influx of not only the indigent, which really didn't bother me, but crazy people who we had no real capacity to help. And so as that population grew and every drug dealer in town wound up there, you would have a tent and like this tent over here was where you would go for heroin and this is where you would go for methamphetamine and this is where you would go for cocaine. And it became this really bizarre situation where we realized we were dealing with all of the problems of the outside society being imposed on us in a way that was really subversive. People were trying to get rid of us. And it started to make people feel unsafe. It's how I got involved with the Safer Spaces Working Group, which was we had certain tents that were monitored at night. So if you were especially female or, or gay, lesbian, transgender, and you were sleeping in the park, that there was a, a community watch and safer spaces to make sure that, especially at night, that you felt safe and that no one was going to bother you. We started with harm reduction to deal with drug addicts and needle exchange and how to make sure you weren't transmitting diseases if that was your issue. And we had a network, of, a medical network of social workers and, and nurses and doctors who would help anybody who not only had medical problems, but if you had substance abuse issues, we had referrals of people who would help you. We even had 12-step meetings that began in the park. Um, we did everything we could to model something better than than the punitive justice system that was on the outside. Mm -hmm. But we were extra challenged because I think just organically, that many problems would not have sprung up right away so quickly if the city wasn't didn't have a vested interest in sending them our way to disrupt what we were doing. So right. when the tents come up, you were able to hide sort of nefarious things from public view, so more of it went on. Right. Uh, and it's a good point to make that that was not a proportional organic growth of population you know that would have a percentage of those kinds of issues it was just ramped up you know overtly and deliberately and you guys were scrambling just to deal with them and from the you know outside looking in all of us that were viewing that we saw just daily increases in social issues and social challenges and the huge huge effort you guys were doing to try to do the right thing to try to help people, to try to deal with it. But it was almost like it was just, you know, you were just overwhelmed by the numbers. Um, is that a fair characterization? It is, but there were also some beautiful things that occurred. I remember this one man who came in who was homeless and, and when he walked in, he almost looked dejected, beaten. Two days later, I saw him working like a 15 hour day in the Occupy kitchen because we fed thousands of people and he took great pride in the food that he was cooking, and he talked about that he was a homeless veteran, but he'd been a cook when he was in the military. And he really took pride in the work that he was doing, and it gave me the sense that if you give someone meaningful work to do that they can take ownership of, it's not about the paycheck you get at the end, because trust me, no one was getting paid. They worked extra hard because they were now part of a community where they had respect, and people had their back, they had people to talk to, and they plugged into a greater social social movement. So I saw beautiful things happen all the time where overnight people's lives were transformed because they were now part of a community that had a different value system. It wasn't about what you had in your pocket, it was what you had in, in your character. Right. Um, at the time, were you guys that were in the park and doing all this work, were you aware of the support of the online community and you know all that activity that was happening external to the park or was that 
kind of just like out of your 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 realm of conscious at the moment a little aware like there was a station in the park where someone had set up a, a computer and people were just leaving messages but we could see the messages coming from around the world and it was sort of staggering and then as we saw the the, the growth of occupies in places all all over the world in little tiny you know people going for marches in north dakota just made no sense to me and and no one had any but we were so busy constantly with this action and that action and and i was in three different working groups and i was up at the crack of dawn and sometimes not asleep till midnight one two in the morning and sometimes not even then if it was my lovely night to do laundry where i got to do pounds and pounds of laundry then so no i wasn't as aware of it until after the eviction okay. at the time that i was in the park it was like this this steamroller that kept rolling that had a life of its own and until november 15th i don't think it had a real a real sense of anything outside the bubble right because you were just you were in it and living it moment to moment and you can only have so wide a scope of vision i would suspect especially you know, with the contrast of the challenges you were again up against and the good work you were trying to do and the explosion of the political attention on it and it was it was a big big deal and this is a question we always have you know as part of the peripheral you know group that aren't on the ground at all or when, as much as we would like to be is like how can we engage with with you guys and how can we be connected and and how can we help so i'm probably going to bring that up at points along the conversation um just so we can all have a good picture of that um and so for, for me though i mean i really feel like there's no there is no difference between i mean, there, I mean everybody who's a part of the movement is an, is an occupier. There isn't like someone's more or less than somebody else. I mean, not, I was only able because I was, I was, I was unemployed. I'd been laid off and I was on unemployment, which ran out of, during the time that I was in, in Liberty Plaza. And I was able at that point, I don't, I don't have children. I don't have, I didn't have other reasons that, that would have prevented me from being there full time. And so it was, a luxury in a way that I was able to go ahead and see this opportunity, see that this was a different, a different form of activism, and, and it and it felt extremely important to me personally to be there and and to and to witness it and to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. But everybody who was a part of it, the people who, I mean, there was constantly food being brought to the park, and people who would come and offer us showers, and people would say, "Oh, you can you can come and do the laundry here," and and the people who offered to, to pay for for copying and the people who donated energy in terms of silk screening and arts and culture and legal help and i can't even tell you how much i'm in love with the national lawyers guild and all the people who dedicated their time and money in small and large ways were all occupiers and all part of it and everybody who paid attention and had that dinner conversation whether it was you know in the middle, in the middle of Manhattan, or it was in Greenville, South Carolina, or it was in Flagstaff, Arizona, that conversation that resonated around the country and around the world was just as vital as anything we were doing in Liberty, because it made it, it made what we were doing have resonance, because if we were doing it in a vacuum, it wouldn't matter. There have been protests for years and years and years, especially in the quote-unquote liberal centers of this country. There's always somebody bitching about something in New York City or San Francisco that, trust me, people in where I grew up in Tampa could care less about it. Those crazy people in New York are doing something again. For some reason, this resonated. It's because people have these conversations all over the country, and that's equally, if not more important than anything we were doing on the ground. Yeah. Um, that was so well said, and you know, I think this is a conversation we need to continu continue throughout the movement. Um, you, you hit on one of my favorite things that um, all actions for Occupy are valid, you know, no matter where they're taking place. You know, a, a person writing a letter or making a phone call or calling a police department um, has an equally vested interest in the movement as a person on the ground marching and protesting. And it's going to take all of us to be able to shift the paradigm. I, I sincerely believe that. Um, Absolutely. So, were, did you happen to be 
in the park the night of the eviction? <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Middle of the night when they like to come. Right. And it was. It wasn't surprising because we had like eviction scare number one previously when all the unions came down and the night that it rained and at five o'clock in the morning there were thousands of people there and they backed down. But on that particular night, I saw a couple of things that I'll never forget. I mean, I remember some blue shirt NYPD officers stepping down, refusing orders of their superiors, saying this was not what they had signed up for. Um, at that point, we had about 5,000 books in the Occupy Wall Street Library. I saw easily a thousand of them thrown into a, a garbage truck that had a compactor in it. So when it was thrown in, it destroyed the book as it crushed it around. In fact, I have a, a meeting with an attorney on Madison Avenue Monday to talk about a, a pending lawsuit that we have against the city for the destruction of books. Excellent. Um, and obviously, what happened there is that somewhere along the way, they had told somebody that the books were going to be able to be recovered because about 45 minutes into the eviction, which began around 1 in the morning, about 1.45, the, the big truck compactor garbage thing drove away and a flatbed truck came up and the rest of the books went on the flatbed truck. So that's why when they brought all those books to storage, I believe the storage people, when they say they gave us back all the books that were delivered there because the ones prior had been destroyed. Right. What they came through... With very little, you know, not waking people up violently, ripping down their tents. There were a couple of dogs that people had in their tents that were killed that night. I don't think NYPD set out to kill the dogs, but I just think they didn't care that they were there, and they were so violent in the way they were tearing down the tents that the, the dogs were just damaged in the, in the process. And I had a... a, a Star of David, it's one of my favorite stories to tell. I told it um, Christmas Eve during our Occupy Christmas celebration that uh, a man, Bernard Schwartzman, um, who lives upstate in New York, and who's an old man and is like 90, who came to the park one day and handed me a Star of David that his wife had worn when she was liberated from Auschwitz at the end of World War II. And she had died previously, and he'd been following this, and he said that his wife had been a lifelong social activist, and he'd been concerned about the direction of the country and the increased um, militarization of the police force and reminded him of what happened prior to, to, to the Nazis coming to power. And he wanted me and, and us to have, to have his wife, Star of David. And so I was trying to save that Star of David the night of the eviction, and it was um, snatched from me from an officer who then it went in and got destroyed with all the books. And, and that's an image I won't forget. I remember the, the people in the kitchen who were linked arm in arm, soft blocking the kitchen and, and defending it. And I remember that the, 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 I'm just destroying everything there, taking the media equipment away. And they weren't just confiscating it as though, you know, they were going to take it in a police raid and then index it and give it to you later. They were smashing it on the ground and taking great delight in smashing the equipment and the personal belongings and the, and the signs and the artwork that had been created. And I'm very, very grateful that people thought um, to save uh, the, the Occupy Wall Street Poetry Anthology. And there's great work going on there, largely because I have to give credit to, to Stephen Boyer, uh, who is one of the librarians who has been working tirelessly with the, with the Occupy Wall Street Poetry Anthology. To make sure that it's available and it is available on, on WordPress for anybody can it's in a PDF file anybody can download it's free. Um, there also have been some bound copies that they've raised money to pay for and a couple have already been donated to the New York City Public Library and so, so some things like that were able to, to be saved but so much of the media equipment and the kitchen and the resources were just completely destroyed and of course the people arrested and, and it was just it was just really a, a devastating show of force, but but, uh, I'll, I'll, but I can say that it wasn't everybody. I saw blue shirts step down from, from their superiors and say they were going to participate in this, and I know that the NYPD recruited people from around around the area that had never been to OWS, so they had no feelings one way or the other about it. I'm sure they looked for specific types who would enjoy this sort of operation. 
and it was and the media blackout where they were shunted away and unable to film and get anywhere close. They closed the subways all around it. It was an orchestrated, militarized attack, and and it was extremely violent and and disheartening. And the very next day, immediately, our legal team got an injunction that allowed us to get back in the park, and just, they just ignored it and didn't allow us in. And, and part of it, you have to realize, is that Brookfield Management, who, who the, the private uh, part of the private public space that we were in, on their board of directors is a woman who is Mayor Bloomberg's girlfriend. So I think that there is a little, a little bit, I don't know, I won't go into what I think of that, but it was, it was just horrible. And, and I don't think a lot of the people who lived through that night have fully emotionally processed it. It was brought back up in everyone's sensory recall on the night of March 17th, when we went back for the, the six months um, and it ended in um, another unnecessary beatdown by the NYPD. So right. I don't know. I know That's it's I can say. a very difficult, I mean, just hearing you describe it, um, you know, it was just my, my heart just sunk again because I, you know, thanks to live stream, I, we witnessed a lot of that and it was, it was a shameful, shameful moment in American history. I mean, that may sound overly dramatic, but I think it really, it really shined a light on what we're confronted with and, and God bless you guys for being there and living through that. And I know you have to revisit it in your mind. Um, we were watching, you know, the While We Watch documentary, and it had some of that that footage in there, and everybody had the same reaction. It was just, it was just devastating. Um, but I, I don't want to dwell on that too much. Thank you for sharing those those observations. I know it was not easy or pleasant to relive that here, but thank you for shining yet some more light on it. Um, so let's talk about what happened after the wreckage. You know, we 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 lost the park. Winter came. You know, things were happening. It was a struggle through the winter. And so, share a little bit of your experience with that. You know, especially because I know safe places were were really really active at that time because of the churches and where people were going to sleep. And also outreach. You haven't spoken very much about that, but I know you were heavily involved in outreach, and I would love for you to share some of that information. Well, the outreach during the period that we were in, in Liberty was easy because it, there were just tables on both ends, and it was a constant stream of people coming by and going through and the conversations that we had. And that was, and there would be outreach that would go every day just onto the subway, and you talk to people, and and go to Penn Station and Grand Central and Times Square, and, and it just seemed to happen organically. People would show up and be energized because they were in a think tank, come over to the outreach table and say, I want to help in some way. And I remember just taking a group of, of college students that were in town doing whatever. They weren't even from New York. I said, well, let's just go on the subway and just talk to people. And that happened all the time. After the eviction... Can I interrupt just for a moment? Yeah. Whenever you did an exercise like that, this is assuming that you, you weren't necessarily preaching to the choir. You were just engaging passerby, correct? Yeah, what right. was the response you were getting from the public? I mean, did did they listen? Did they engage? Did they ignore? What? How did that go? Well, I mean... It's, New Yorkers are an odd lot. If you get their attention, then generally they'll they'll hear you out. And I would say the vast, I'd say the majority, like 70 to 80 percent of the people that I spoke to during that period were supportive of what the movement was doing. Of the group that would actually listen to you, right, right. some people not listen to you. Or if you're on the subway, they're intensely involved with their iPad or their Kindle or whatever they're doing, and they're just not they're not having it. But but for people who would listen to you, they were. It resonated with them because you, New York City is a city where New York is an incredible city. It's a beautiful city, but it's also an example of capitalism gone sick. Um, the, the the rents are outrageous. The cost of living is outrageous, and all the wonderful things that are in New York, the the multiculturalism, uh, all the, the all all the communities that live together in relative harmony compared to other large urban areas, the the explosion of creativity and the arts. That's all here, and that's all very attractive, and, and you can feel that energy in the streets. But it's also the corporatization of all that is really 
it's really hit hard. I mean, mm-hmm. all, the, all the young people who come here with stars in their eyes realize that they're going to have to work 70 hours or 80 hours a week just to live in a little hobble, and there's not much time left for them to be an artist, a sculptor, a painter, a dancer, a, an actor, or whatever they want to be. And even if they want to be all that, Bank of America and, and Credit Suisse and Disney and everybody else like has their fingers in that pot. So the ability to be creative without corporate oversight is has been diminished greatly in New York City over well since Giuliani. So everybody resonates with it. It's not if people listen they, and they hear it, they they feel that it impacts their lives in one way or another if, if they're in the city. And you can't and you walk down the street and every block you're marketed to. In a city that used to pride itself on being really unique in every block, now you walk down most blocks and it's Chase Manhattan Bank, followed by Dwayne Reed, which is like a, a drug store. Yeah. Every block here, followed by Starbucks, followed by another Chase. So it's, it's all looking the same, and, and Applebee's and Red Lobster, and it's all this every every you know it starts starting to look like everywhere else. Right. And that's and that's not good. Right. I would agree with you. Uh, you know, I live in a very rural area, and so for years you you hear about the whole Starbucks on every corner phenomena. And I remember the first time I went up to New York, and it's true. I mean, they're literally at an intersection. There's a Starbucks on every corner, and how homogenized the the cityscape is anymore. Um, and it's that way in every major city I've been to in the last 10 years, and it's getting worse. And I think it depersonalizes everything. And so we, we all lose, you know, from the loss of diversity. Um, but I'm a musician, and just to, and from a music perspective, the corporatization has really hurt music in this country. That every, no matter what radio station you listen to, no matter what city you're in, it all sounds the same because it's all programmed by the same people who are interested in business and the bottom line and not at all in art. So if you're a local musician or artist, you can't break out on a local radio station because they will not play you. Right. Won't. Well, you know, these are the dilemmas that we face because of the corporatization of nearly everything. And I, I'm a working artist too, and so we have these debates all the time about that very thing like you know do you do you cater to an audience so you you get you know exposure or do you stay true to your vision and try to make connections one-on-one and then of course it's the economic overhead of everything drives so many decisions because we're all trying to keep our head above water so these are all things that need to change um one of i'm sorry i digress but i love hearing these stories Um, I want to get back to um, during the winter, the safer spaces and outreach, and also you were involved in direct action, and I don't know how much you can speak to that, but if you could maybe just give a brief overview of what direct direct action is and, um, you know, how how much you feel comfortable speaking about that. Well, I mean, I... Direct action, as I said, it, it began with me personally in my ACT UP days where where there are times when you have to do something to show that it's not business as usual, that there's a crisis going on. In the ACT UP days, when I remember when we blocked the, the Santa Monica freeway in L.A. and at rush hour and prevented people from exiting the freeway onto, onto Wilshire Boulevard, um, I remember this one woman like, ran up and screamed at me that she had a nails appointment in Beverly Hills and I was keeping her from her nails appointment. And I said, well, that's nice. Um, I've been to 14 funerals in the last 60 days of men in their 20s who are dying, and the government doesn't seem to give a crap about it, so deal with your nails. I said, people need to wake up that there's a crisis going on. So direct action forces people to take a look at what they're doing. It doesn't necessarily have to be an arrestable action, um, but it's usually, in the way we've used it in Occupy, designed um, to really shine the light on something in a way that you can really tell what's going on. An example would be something we did yesterday um, at, at um, the Attorney General's office, at Schneiderman's office. Uh, there was a, um, we we're talking about sort of foreclosure issues, and that Obama in the State of the Union said, you know, we really, we, we need everyone's help, all Americans need to get together and help to find the people who are the culprits in, in, in these large banks that are creating a situation where illegal foreclosures are going on and blah, 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 blah. And maybe he means that. Let's give him the benefit of the doubt. But 
50 people have been assigned to this nationally to work on this. So we all went. Uh, Direct Action decided we would go to Shatterman's office and offer our services that we're very good at many things. We can Google and we can find information for them and we can use the phone and file and we've compiled lots of data on, on the problem in Bank of America and Chase and Wells Fargo and we have lots of foreclosure data and we know the people that you should be going after and perhaps the people the district attorney's office should be focusing on to bring some indictments. And um, we would like to see the attorney general and his staff and assist in any way in, in the forming a task force of people who have an interest. And we brought people who have been foreclosed on there, who had a, a special relationship with the foreclosure process. And of course they wouldn't see us and the police were called and, and there are people who remained and refused to leave and got arrested because they said, we're simply doing what we feel our responsibility is. And that action is designed not so much to get somebody arrested, but to point out that we have a real problem going on. And what the government is saying is that they want everyone's help to solve this problem, but they don't really want that. What they really want to do is protect the banks, give lip service to the solution, and, and let business as usual go on. And direct action says we cannot have business as usual or in a crisis. Right. I, I love, you know, my favorite term is resistance to the business of usual, um, <laughs> which is exactly what what you're doing there. So, so I always feel very optimistic when I see something like that happen. Um, what is your, um, what's your current action in Occupy now? What are you doing these days? I, I know you're part of the group that are on the steps frequently. Is that accurate? Well, I've been, um, well, I've been, yeah, I've been largely, you know, like the whole, once my, my unemployment ran out, I be, began to join the ranks of the homeless occupiers, but I'm, I mean, currently I'm, I'm planning on, on going back to California. I, I was in the hospital about a month ago and had some blood tests and was actually diagnosed with cancer and leukemia, so I need to go through radiation and perhaps chemotherapy, and I postponed that. Um, because I was involved in the May Day planning, mm -hmm. but um, just for, for many reasons, and largely because I just don't have any money, I need to go to California where I can, am a legal resident and can get Medi-Cal and get the help that I need. And so in the short term, <laughs> try to save my life, and then plug myself maybe into Occupy LA for a while, although I have every intention of being part of the organizing and planning and coming back to New York for September 17th, um, but I know there's incredible work going on in L.A. I I'm I'm, was once a large part of the activist community in L.A., and Occupy Los Angeles is still, it, not is still, they have been and continue to be a force to be reckoned with in the landscape of Southern California, and I hope to, to plug in. I know they have the General Assemblies at Pershing Square in downtown L.A. on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and I would be surprised since if I would, if I would find myself down there within moments of getting to Southern California because I'm interested in, in in what they're doing in what they're doing there. I don't know if that answers it. But. Well it, it did and um, you know it was um, I didn't know how to bring that little bit up but I want you to know that all of us have you in our hopes and prayers for you know a, a, a positive treatment and hopefully a good recovery or you know, placing the leukemia and all that in remission. I know that is a huge thing to be facing and just know there's a lot of people out here that love you and care about you and are grateful for all the work you've done and we will be as supportive as we possibly can and um, you know, we, we wish you wish you well. And my understanding is you'll be leaving to go out west pretty soon. Yeah, yeah, I am. I mean, I've been like sort of beg, borrowing, and stealing. I've been trying to raise money any way I can to like facilitate the process. I have a job out when I get out there, which is kind of cool, but I sort of have, I know that I'm going to be sort of, even when I start, it'll be three weeks, so I get a paycheck, and I'm just trying to raise the money to deal with like that three-week period. I can work while I'm getting radiation because, you know, I'm tough. So, and, and I have no other choice, to be honest. I don't have time to like, lie around and watch Oprah. I guess Oprah's not on anymore. I'm out of the loop. Whoever's on now. I have no time to lie around and watch it if I had a television to watch it on or a place to put the television in. Right. But so that's kind of what I've been doing and trying to raise money to like sort of get my living expenses taken care of. Cause one of the reasons I'm going to go to California is I know how their Medi-Cal system works and that, and the, 
it's just going to be easier for me to plug into that right. and ultimately get assistance with with some of the medical expenses, whereas I'm not really plugged into New York, and it would be everything's more expensive in New York, and it would just and the amount of money that I need to raise would be like double. So right. now I'm trying to raise like fifteen hundred dollars to live for a month and then go to work, as opposed to it would be three four thousand to even think about surviving in New York. Right. So that's kind of what I'm doing well, now. when you when you get a plan and a system together, you need to be sure to let us know, and we'll we'll help help to do that we try to be very supportive of all our guests and all their projects and you know any challenges that they are you know we we're um we have a large group that watches us and a lot of channels that screencast us so it never hurts to ask because this is all about people helping people this is the new reality if we don't help each other you know we can't depend on institutions and organizations to do it for us we have to do we have to do it for each other. Um, so I just throw that out. So do let us know when you get something together where we can help you out on that. Um, well, I mean, you know, I mean, I, I, I was funny. I was at the May Day um, March the other day and the debrief today. And, and I was thinking that even on the March, I was looking around thinking, gosh, there's like at least 30,000 people here. If I can get 1,500 of them to give me a dollar. There you go, yeah. So it's like, so if there's 1,500 people out there have a dollar, or what would the math be? More realistically, it's like if there's, I don't know. I need to, in real real reality, I need to raise about a thousand dollars. Yeah. So, and that would, that would get me through a paycheck and keep me in, keep me in aspirin and and ramen noodles and whatever it is I need. You can contact us off the off this interview, and you know we'll help brainstorm some ways to do that in short order. Um, sure. <laughs> so, what is the biggest lesson you've learned as part of Occupy? Oh gosh, um, you know after the after the eviction and after the N17 action, where which was really for it to be two days after the eviction to see 30,000 people on the Brooklyn Bridge, and the Illuminator, you know, putting the back signal lights up on the buildings was breathtaking. And I went from there, I went back to Florida for about three weeks. I went to Tampa, I got involved in Occupy Tampa. Mm -hmm. And that was an amazing experience for me. Having grown up in the Tampa Bay area, this is a very conservative part of Florida. In fact, the Republican convention is going to be there in August. Um, There's, you know, a a church in every corner. There was a thriving Occupy movement and people that were, were out having amazing general assemblies and to have and to have people in my hometown having these kinds of conversations was amazing to me mm-hmm. and, and I never thought that I would have ever seen that happen. Florida is not a place where people go to get involved in social or economic movements. People, as I like to say, move to Florida and turn their mind off. And for the first seven years, they're just astounded that it didn't snow all winter. And then they come out of their fog and they realize that the schools suck, um, there's no money, the, the health care system's terrible, the infrastructure is going to hell, and the tax rate's going up and they're getting nothing for it. But by then, they're on death watch because they're really old. So it's like they don't care anymore. And that's this weird, and for people who are supportive in Florida, they tend to not invest in the local community. Like if you're from Chicago or New York and you're a supporter of the arts, you send your contributions back to the New York Philharmonic or the Chicago Symphony. You don't give two cents to the Florida Symphony. And so you have people begging for their payroll down there. And it's just really, really, really difficult. And then with the, the, the Gulf oil spill that went on. And so to go back to Florida after the eviction for a couple of weeks and see all of the community coming together in ways very different from New York, but having the exact same conversation about disempowerment and, and corporate personhood. And they had actions where they went out on Black Friday and Mike checked at Walmarts and talked to how Walmart was taking over the world and, and did it in a way that did not shame you for shopping there because what else, what choice do you have? They're like a steamroll that comes into a town, not shaming the employees who are are browbeaten and threatened if they attempt to unionize. Um, they went and Mike checked some restaurants who our collective restaurant association in Florida is is um, threatening to 
take the minimum wage down to two something an hour from four something an hour for tipped employees um, because that would I don't know why they're planning to do that because to I guess give them more profit and they had a, an action plan at a, a, an accounting firm which was a, a funnel for uh, political PAC and super PAC money which is sort of the worst example of Florida politics and they picketed there they attempted to take a park and have the largest civil disobedience arrest in Tampa history, which, you know, this is not too hard to park the waters in the bathtub, but still, 29 people got arrested. <laughs> and I love that. That's amazing for Tampa, Florida. That, you know, they had hundreds of people at a GA, 29 people got arrested, um, and they have the NLG working with them to challenge it on constitutional reasons. They're actively fighting the clean zone that's being created for the RNC. And... I never would have thought growing up that that would be going on, on in Florida, and that sort of charged me a little bit. And then I, I came back to New York and was living in uh, one of the churches in Brooklyn in Park Slope that the OWS was working on, and we had an incredible, I don't know if you remember about New Year's Eve, but New, Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve were both beautiful. Mm. Christmas Eve, we had, uh, it was so cold, it was so cold that night, but we stayed in, in, in Liberty Plaza the whole night, and and hassled by the police who at this point were like, we had Christmas food and they wouldn't let us bring it in the park. You had to give it to people on the sidewalk and then they could bring a plate into the park and it was all this nonsense. But we had people sitting down talking about their own spirituality, whether it came from from a particular religion or, or not, and, and had this conversation going on all night about what social and economic justice meant to them from a spiritual perspective and it was a really beautiful way to spend Christmas Eve. Um, cheering up thinking about it. It's one of the most beautiful Christmases I ever spent. Um, New Year's Eve was just incredible. We pulled all the barricades down and threw them in a big pile and danced around. Um, and then, you know, they boarded up the park and then let us back in. But, oh well. Uh, but it was a nice act of defiance. And, and right after the beginning of the year, we had an incredible actions protesting the NDAA in, in Grand Central. I mean, actions kept going on all winter and meetings, and we just moved into different meeting spaces and church basements and, and union halls. But it was rough because there was a war between the park was an equalizer, and without the park, there were people not willing to spend money to give to the churches to house people who had nowhere to go. And so ultimately, by the middle of February, housing money was cut off and people were thrown out on the street in the middle of the winter <laughs> me being one of them so freezing cold nights like wandering around and trying to sleep in hospital emergency rooms because sometimes if you go in and just sit and act like you know somebody they'll let you stay there um and freezing on the subway and and then still all day long going to this meeting or that meeting and we were working on the community agreement consents to the spokes council at this point through safer spaces. We had an February 17th, I remember we had a, a, a poetry anthology reading in the East Village at a church and mm -hmm. a lot of poets came together and, and people brought their own material to read. We read from the anthology and that was and that was beautiful. And then like sort of a breath of fresh air, March 17th came and I don't think anyone expected thousands to show up, but thousands showed up. It was a beautiful day in Liberty Plaza and Nothing was planned. I was part of the planning of that day. It was like the anti-planning. We planned to get people together to remind them how much we all cared about each other, how much the movement meant to us. And we had one of the most functional general assemblies we'd had in a long time, where many, many people sat and got into breakout groups to discuss May Day. And we uh, had a, a let we consensed on a letter condemning the profiling of the Muslim community in New York by the by the NYPD. And it was just a beautiful, beautiful day that ended with the police coming in saying that, you know, at, at midnight they had this sudden need to clean the park. And we all had to get out, and 60-some people were arrested violently. I was batoned all up and down my arm. I was black and blue. I left the park bleeding. And I was, but I wasn't hurt as much as most people because I was not in jail or, or in the hospital, so I got to be the poster boy at a, at a news conference on, on Monday morning um, 
where I said, I'm only here at the news conference because I'm not hurt enough to be hospitalized. There was a, people had their ribs broken and, and it was another, it was reminiscent of, of the eviction in November of, of the violence. But I think they thought that was, I think the authorities were frightened by the number of people who showed up in Liberty on, on March 17th, thinking spring's coming and we're not gonna let this happen again. Mm -hmm. And only people marched in the middle of the night to Union Square and said, all right, we're gonna stay here now. And since March 17th, we began spring training every Friday and there's been this energy that's been growing and growing and growing. And then we probably had conservatively 20 to 30,000 people on the street May Day. And so it's kind of like whatever you want to do to us, does this look dead to you? Do you think that you can beat a few people and arrest a few people and that's going to end it? So I think, I hope that I hope that the powers that be are starting to see that we're not going anywhere and maybe a better tactic might be to have a conversation with us about the best way to move forward this summer because I hope that the energy this summer in New York, I'll probably be in Los Angeles, but anywhere because they face repression everywhere. The LAPD are really no better than NYPD and Oakland PD seem to take the cake on brutality. Yeah. And hopefully we can have a summer dialogue with summer town square a summer a summer of, of real conversation amongst the diversity of people in this country about how we envision a better world that's economically and socially just and available to everyone and that would be a much better way to spend the summer than having a constant war with with police departments over this park or that park or this city ordinance or that city ordinance yep. much more productive and much more viable um, that was so the eloquently is, put. You know, thank thank you so much for. Well, the for, joke is that if they would just enforce the banking regulations the same way they enforce these little park regulations, we wouldn't have to be in a park in the first place. But they don't seem to do that. Yeah. Um, well, that you know kind of opens up for my next question, and I have a couple of more, and then you know we'll take questions from the chatters if you want. Um, we're very conscious of your time and energy, so if, if you, you know, feel like you, you've had enough, just let me know and we can get to a stopping point. Um, my next question is, what do you think the biggest challenge we have to face as a movement is and how should we address it? Well, we have a lot of challenges, but probably, probably the Probably the biggest challenge, because we grew so quickly, so fast in the beginning, is understanding that that Occupy Wall Street did not invent resistance and did not invent and did not invent nonviolent direct action, and that some of the headiness, because of, of a lot of the people involved in the planning and the orchestration of it in New York, anyways, were very very young. Sometimes there's a, an egoism about it, and I think the ego needs to be checked at the door because we're starting to really resonate, and I saw it on May Day, in very diverse communities everywhere, young, old, black, white, gay, straight, Latino, Asian, and that's a beautiful kaleidoscope of what this country and this world is, but there's a history and a culture of resistance and, and, and activism in all of these communities that needs to be respected and, and needs to and we need to be available to link these communities together and use our energy to make us all a united strong front against the same corporate powers that oppress and not let not go into this thinking that here's Occupy Wall Street come to save the day because I think that's a really that's a, that's a danger when, when you're dealing and, and it's just wrong we're not here to save the day we're just the latest incarnation of an age-old struggle, um, you know, what did Jesus say, there will be poor always. So it's an age-old struggle, and we need to know that we're lucky and to have been empowered so quickly and to have the spotlight this quickly, and we should use it with respect to gather diverse communities together so that we don't lose this moment and we don't lose this energy and we can build something bigger, brighter, and more beautiful and not get lost in our own sense of self-importance. That was wonderfully stated. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I, I agree wholeheartedly, and so do many others. And you know, our, 
our mission is to unify, you know, any way that we can and to build bridges and make connections because once we do that, you know, person to person, then if we make it personal, we will win. If we yeah. let it stay abstract, we'll lose. It has to be personal. I had a conversation Monday, Tuesday, Mayday night, late Mayday night in, in, in Liberty with one of the white shirts, the, the uh, higher ups in the police department. That was a hopeful conversation. He um, came up to a bunch of us and he said, once we, about 200 people wound up back, back in Liberty Plaza after people got arrested down at 55 Water and then two marches took off and one got kettled and arrested and there's about a thousand people that were assembly at 55 Water. And he came and said, are the people in, in the park planning to stay all night? I said, I think some people I think are, yeah. And he says, well, okay. He said, I'm going to cut a lot of the people that are on duty. It's been a long day for the police. And I don't think there's a need for all of them to be here staring at you guys all night. And he told me that there was a, a box of space blankets and, and hand warmers and stuff that was left down by the bull after a melee that got somebody arrested. And he thought it was getting colder, that some of us might need them. Um, did he want somebody to bring them up? Or, or, and I said, well, I'll help you bring them up here. And I looked at him, I don't know why you're being so nice, but fine. And, and I got his story. He grew up in the Bronx, and I listened. And that's... And that's hopeful to me because I don't, as, as much as I, I think police brutality needs to be condemned, I think we actually should have in New York uh, a federal investigation into the police brutality mm -hmm. in the city. Department of I Justice. Don't that, yep. I don't think that I, I have the right to take it out or have, make a sweeping statement about every individual member of the police force because their lives are as underwater financially as anybody else's. They're as invested in this community as anybody else. And to me, they are welcome at the table of this dialogue. And I had a human moment with, with a class of, of the NYPD that I don't normally get, get a human moment with because the higher ups tend to be jerks. And I realized that that's, I don't know where I went with this. I just, I'm getting old and lost my train of thought, but that, that was a hopeful moment for me the night of May Day. And that's, that's talking about that personal one-on-one -on -one reach out that we, we can reach anybody. There's not there's not a group of people that I don't think we should be reaching out to because I don't think we should have preconceived notions about how the message will be received. Mm -hmm. I think the, the message should be available and anybody who wants to participate in the conversation should be welcome at the table. We shouldn't be saying, well, you've done this or that or you work in this industry or you make too much money or blah, blah, blah. That everybody's welcome at the table. It doesn't make any difference to me where you come from just because you make a lot of money, you're not the enemy. Because um, making a lot of money isn't the problem. It's the, the system that's created that gives money the ultimate value in the society. It's not that you have a lot in your personal bank account. Right. Um, that was such an inspiring story. And it's, it's something I struggle with personally about not, not demonizing people. You know, we look at the institution. It's, it's hard to make any any kind of positive comment, say, about the NYPD or the Oakland PD, you know, just the whole thing, if you view it. But once you are able to talk to the people, they fundamentally, they are people, and some of them are good people. And um, I go back and forth with this constantly about being disciplined not to make a general statement. But then when you see... Like something like when you, you get beaten or we see a tear gassing or something, then you just, your immediate reaction was all those guys suck. <laughs> and, you know, it's a, it's a constant struggle. But I think you made a good point because you invested the time and energy and reason and you made a connection, however small, with the humanity on the other side. And, you know, that's, that's where we start making change, I believe. Um, and in New York City, I mean, bear in mind that the New York City Police Department are being asked to do things no police department should be asked to do. I mean, they've been asked to take on issues of national security and all this nonsense like since 9-11. And there's been a certain militarization of the police force that I've definitely noticed in New York since 9-11. That's ridiculous. And that's all done, I think, for political reasons, and I could go on and on about what I think about that. But they're being asked to do things that are not, I think, in their job description. And right. so... 
and there's 35,000 of them, and we also have an administration that I put a lot of all the blame on. I cannot stand. I, I try not to hate anybody, but as close as close to it as I can come, I hate Michael Bloomberg. And if he isn't the personification of what's wrong in this country, and his arrogant self, like disregarding the voters in the city who decided that there should be term limits, and only he's decided he was king, and he got a third term as mayor, and his his cavalier attitude, and he acts like everybody else is a peasant, and he's the only person wise or smart enough with his billions in the bank to to come to the aid of anybody who needs it, and the survival of the fittest. Ugh can't stand that man and his whole and if his response was different to the Occupy movement then we wouldn't be having the problems we have with the police because make no mistake the, the blame is in, in his hands and I think he's directing him and Ray Kelly are directing everything in the city that's harming that's harmful to the Occupy movement I don't think your average police officer has would on their own wake up one day and think oh, let's, let's go harass occupiers about food and how big their backpack is and whether they can sit here or stand there. I mean, it's all just it's all just demeaning to the police officers who you know, really do do heroic things in the city to make it safer. It's a much safer city than it once was. And all the all the praise that they got after 9-11 for their heroism was, was just. I mean, they do amazing things every day. And then here they are being asked, to like essentially harass people for exercising their First Amendment rights, and some of them get off on it. I mean, whatever. But that and they should be held accountable for that. But the direction is coming from on high, and so the real hate mail should be going to Michael Bloomberg. And I, I think we should be standing out his, outside his house on 79th Street, screaming 24/7. Right. Well, you know. You, you know, you just mentioned something that, that I hadn't thought of, that the heroes of 9-11, a lot of them are the bad guys now. And that, that gap is just so huge. And so you you know that that has to be coming from, from above. And somehow we just need to, we just need to hold Bloomberg and Kelly and, and all those people accountable. You know, I don't know how to do it, but we need to be in their face with the questions 24-7, loudly and stridently. Um, and thank you for helping <laughs> to make that possible and, and doing that. So I, I have my last question, um, and then you can, you can feel free to speak to whatever you want to, and chatters will start taking questions if Sue can kind of facilitate that, if anybody has questions for Billy. While he's answering this last question, we'll start getting those up. So my last question is the question of revolution versus reform. And we talk about this a lot, and there are divided interests there. So I'm interested in your observation, you know, revolution, reform, or is there a middle way that we can achieve you know, progress towards social, economic, and environmental justice? I think it's going to take all of that and then some. So you can't deny the system that we're in. But I also, some, I've been asked this question a lot. And I think if you look back to the recent past and look at the fall of, of communism behind the Berlin Wall, and the people who were working in the movement to make that fall and, and reunite Germany and reunite the East and the West had no idea when that was going to happen. And I remember talking to people who were involved in that at the time thinking, you know, if we just keep pushing and we keep trying, then maybe in 10 years or maybe in 20 years and in less than eight months, the Berlin Wall fell. And it's because the people finally came to consensus that the system they were living and working under didn't work at all. They had no faith in it whatsoever, and they were willing to suffer any consequence to let it fail and rebuild again. And so I think the same can be said about capitalism in the United States. Not that capitalism in and of itself is a dirty word, but the, its manifestation right now where it's, where it's profit at all costs and profit over people, um, for, for that to crumble and fall and the Wall Street culture of, of leveraged buyouts and 
investing in financial instruments that where you you profit financially when another company fails or your stock goes up when somebody's laid off and you're investing in nothing that produces nothing and all of that for that culture to change and to be toppled it, don't discount that that can happen relatively quickly if we continue to and continue and continue to unite communities and build consensus that this system is failing and we need something different we need to push it over so that's going to come in a variety of ways if someone wants to write write a letter i mean the old-fashioned letter where you write it in hand in, out in handwriting put a stamp on it and mail it to their local representative especially because they're very receptive to that sort of thing and, and the, the state legislature most people can't name their state representatives or state senators if you ask the average new yorker who represents them in albany they'll give you a blank stare so if you get involved on that level you can have a great deal of impact in reforming the system by putting pressure on it and the people who say it's not important to vote, it's very important to vote, especially in local elections, because you can impact those kind of races that, that affect your community, the school board, the, all of that. And on the national level, I think we need to have an evolution, if not a revolution, of, of the way of the way we view it. And, and that's going to take probably more militant, more strident direct action. But the simple stuff everybody can do. I'm so tired of people saying, what can I do, what can I do? We've been screaming, move your money since November. Move your money. If you still have money in Chase, in Bank of America, and Wells Fargo, if you still have a, a credit card from the major banks, then cut it up today and like put and do something else. Don't give them any more of your money. Don't have a mortgage and just don't do it. Stop adding adding to their profits. If you want Bank of America to fail, you don't have to chain yourself to to make it fail. Take your money out of it. It'll fail quickly enough. And invest in a credit union, in a union bank, in some financial instrument where you're a shareholder and you have a vote in how they invest their money. You can hold them to a code of ethical standards. And, and anybody can do that. And yes, is it is it inconvenient to not have 800 ATMs to go to? Yeah, it is inconvenient. But this isn't going to be done without sacrifice. But the sacrifice of driving an extra few miles to an ATM or to, what do you need cash for anyways? You can, you can use a debit card to buy most anything these days. Anyhow, it's not that big a sacrifice. And if you're not, if, if you don't want to, if you don't have the time or the energy or the inclination to chain yourself to something and get arrested, you can move your money and you can move your money right now. And that will impact the banking system. You can not um, sell your children down the river. You cannot, you cannot have them sign up for Fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars worth of student debt by the time that they're 24. Um, you can you can look for ways for education. You can force education to be to be something that's uh, uh, available to everyone by not by not playing in, into the into the Ponzi scheme because they're bundling together all the student debt, much like they did the foreclosure debt. And that's just going to be another nightmare. Except the difference is the student debt is already federally insured for the most part. So. When that collapses, guess who's going to pay for it? You and me and everybody else. And we're not going to have, and they're not going to ask us our opinion on whether we get to pay for it. We're just going to have to pay for it. So there's lots of little things we can do to, to impact, to impact it, and it could be inside the system and outside the system. And I think the will for direct action and the will for nonviolent civil disobedience, which is, you know, when people ask me, do I mind that I was arrested? I don't know. I think I stand with. Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks and Gandhi and a lot of people that I'd be happy to sit down and have a glass of wine with. So I'm not worried about my arrest record. And I'm not worried about what some potential employers going to think about it because I don't want to work for somebody who thinks that me having a social conscience is a bad thing because that's probably an employer who wants me to fix the books or do something else I would find unethical anyway. So it's fine. So I have a rap sheet. I haven't knocked over a liquor store. I, I laid down on Wall Street to make sure that our First Amendment rights to protest are, are, are still alive and are still viable in 2012. And I'm not going to sit by idly why those rights are, are being eroded day by day. And I think more and more people are waking up to that. And you can do that in revolutionary ways, and you can do that within the system. And both are equally important, and both need to be done on an ongoing basis. We can't let the ball drop and say, well, that was a nice little thing that Occupy did for a few months. We have to keep doing it or because we don't know when the tipping point is. And that tipping point could be sooner than we think. But if we give up and despair or think that we can't get there or that the sacrifices are too deep, well, the sacrifices were pretty deep for the people who, who you know, 
did the Montgomery bus boycott back in the civil rights movement. For a year, they had to walk to work. The sacrifices were pretty deep for the people who, who got out of jail, went back to the lunch counter, and got milk poured on their head. The sacrifices were pretty deep, you know, for for people for years who fought for social and economic injustice. Some people, Nelson Mandela sat in a jail cell because he's so viscer, viscerally opposed to apartheid. So what, what are these little sacrifices that we're making? They're nothing. So it's time, if you really believe it, then you've got to live that life. Yeah. Thank you. That was an inspiring observation, and I couldn't, couldn't agree more. Um, and I, I love that you bring the historical context to the conversation. I think that's something that is largely missing, but we can learn by the actions of those who preceded us. As you said, resistance is not new to this generation. It's been going on for 3,000 years, so it's helpful to look. So um, if you have a couple more minutes, we'll take a couple of questions. If you feel sure. feel like it, um, somebody asked if you could repeat where you're headed in California. Uh, Los Angeles, L.A. Okay, um, so that was L.A. Ping. Um, Sue's asked if you think that the unions will eventually join with OWS. Mm, they well, might. I mean, I think they're starting to see the big picture. Um, unions are wonderful, but they're awfully myopic. I mean, they look at resistance as we are fighting for the specific contract for the specific group of people to get a raise or better benefits or protect their benefits or to really protect a small group of people and to hell with the barista who has nothing and no insurance and making 7.25 an hour. We're not really ready to be concerned about that. If they have the bigger picture, then they will. And I think they're slowly starting to get the bigger picture because I, I mean, I obviously I'm a supporter of unions, but I think that they can sometimes look at the world through a very small lens and I'm hoping what Occupy can do is get them to see that yes it's important for them to fight for the people within their union but it's just as important for them if they're really talking about labor rights and workers rights to look at all the people look at the migrant farmer who has nothing and the undocumented people picking tomatoes in Ruskin Florida this winter so you can have them fresh in your grocery store and how they're shunted around the country and live in shanties with nothing that it's all equally important and the people equally important and so it's not it's not just the little issue that you're fighting for. You have to have a broader perspective. And I, I think amongst the rank and file and the union members that I see in the various working groups of OWS, that they're definitely waking up to that. It's going to take longer probably for the union leadership because much like corporate leadership, they have a vested interest in the status quo. But I think they'll wake up too or, or they'll be toppled as well. Right. Um, that's a good point because we, we, we have a fair amount of people who are involved with the union so we have that conversation all the time and that's generally where they come down w with you know if they don't if everybody again doesn't come together then we're all going to suffer for it um, we have another question um, do does um, Bloomberg and Kelly do they take credit for the crackdowns on the protests or is that under the cover and do most people believe they and I think you stated this that you believe that they are the ones that drive a lot of the police actions and everything. Oh, I'm certain it is. It's yeah. like Bloomberg, Bloomberg's arrogance is unbelievable, and and he always dismisses Occupy as as like, well, what what are they screaming about? They don't have any message whatsoever, and and his you know and the, the way that New York runs in general it's like whenever they don't know how to get rid of something they say it's a public safety hazard so I remember Bloomberg saying that whenever you have to consider the First Amendment and public safety public safety has to trump the First Amendment and that's why we have to evict all these people out of the park and and he said in the press conference right after the eviction that he that we would you know have to occupy with our minds we were never going to have a physical occupation again he meant it and I believe that we will never have a physical occupation again. Mm -hmm. So not as as Bloomberg's mayor, he's not going to allow it, and he has 35,000 armed troops to carry out his will. So it's just not going to happen. And I think he delights in that. This is a mayor who says that he's one of the people because he rides the subway every day, and I've, I've been on the subway when he rides. He comes in with his entourage of security. It's everybody out of the subway car that he's going in, so he displaces people, slows the subway down, gets on, rides one stop, 
gets out and gets back in his limo. So, you know. Showbiz. Ray Kelly, I don't know what Ray Kelly's deal is. I mean, I, I know that there's a lot of a lot of racist behavior and statements that are attributed to him. And, and he's just part of what's wrong with the, the upper echelon of policing in New York. So the fact that he's considering or running for mayor of the, of the city is troublesome to me. I certainly hope that he does not gain traction in that or and that maybe one of the things within in the sense of reform can be, I think that we need to be out in force in New York City to make sure that we don't replace Michael Bloomberg with Ray Kelly and, and the, the other potential candidate politically, I think the name that's kicked around is Christine Quinn, who's uh, uh, from from Manhattan and and not though not perfect, you know. Well, you could pick anybody off a random person off the street would be better than Ray Kelly as the next mayor of New York, but Christine Quinn would be all right, and, and there'd, be, there'd be certainly no shame in supporting her candidacy if that's the way the chips fall. Right. Um, so free, we kind of answered that question earlier. Billy's going to go to California and deal with some health issues and then he is going to try to become actively involved with probably Occupy LA. Um, are there any more questions from the chat? And if not, I'm going to say thank you, sir, for your time and energy for being here. Do you have anything else you'd like to add? A little bit of soapbox time or you're welcome to it. Um, just that I hope that people out there know that their support is more than appreciated because we know that and that there's so much going on than what the live streamers ever capture. I mean, there were 150 people in a church basement today doing an evaluation of May Day. There's um, over, there's over 156, but that's hyperbole. There's probably about 30, 35 active functioning working groups in Occupy Wall Street that have memberships averaging between 30 to 50, sometimes the 100 people at a meeting that go on all over the city every day that nobody ever really sees, except you see the results of it. And when you see that the kitchen shows up with food, because there's a kitchen working group, you see that um, the, the healthcare for the 99% is a, is, are a lot of working people, nurses and doctors and people involved in the medical industry. We get together to improve that and they they are responsible for all kinds of actions. They surrounded um, the old St. Vincent's Hospital on May Day to point out that there is no hospital below 59th Street in Manhattan on the west side. Um, there's arts and culture working groups that get together to do incredibly creative things, creating the, the, the Lady Liberty that's now popular at all the, all the protests and the, the beautiful um, artwork and banners and, 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 and posters and all the stuff that I can't do. It's gonna be, I, might, I might be good at, you know, writing a sonata, but I'm not very good at like, drawing anything. Cause I, so the people who do the visual things are amazing to me and they're immensely creative. There's um, our wonderful jail support that is tireless and they're at the precincts and they're at, uh, at the tombs and they're, they go to Brooklyn and they go to the Bronx. And now because of the federal arrest, they have to go to the far flung places in Staten Island and Brooklyn to pick people up and make sure that they have, you know, food and, and, and love and support and, and, and when, when they get out of jail. Uh, the, the people involved in our legal working group who, who liaison with the National Lawyers Guild, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people that are involved actively in the movement every day in New York, as I'm sure that mirrors itself around the country, that you don't always see, but they're certainly there and they're tirelessly working and giving up their time. Many people in New York wound up here because like me, they were attracted to, to the energy of the movement and they came here often giving up homes and, and comfort and are, are living, if not on the streets, they're living you know, by the grace of people giving them a couch to sleep on here and a couch to sleep on there. And they're working more than full time on, on social and economic change and pouring all of their talents and hard work into it. And, and, and sometimes I think it can be like, well, you know, I've heard someone walk by the federal steps and say, well, there's six people sitting up there. That's all that's left. It's like, well, no, <laughs> there's a lot of people working to make sure this pulls off. You don't get 30,000 people on the streets, unions and immigrants and everybody else on May Day from eight in the morning until 
until 10 o'clock at night without a lot of organizing behind the scenes and and it, it goes on tirelessly and and, and and a lot of it is is pretty thankless and, and I wish in many ways that the that that there was a way to hook up a lot of these meetings to to the online community so that they not only could see it because it's not really a spectator sport they could have input and send questions and give ideas and participate because if you're a mom with three kids and you can't leave to go to a meeting in the evening you might have incredible ideas about the way this action should go you might have information about the legality of this or whatever i mean you might have really vital input so i think a way of linking up the online community with the people on the ground as part of the meeting structure is a way to draw more people in and have more people be stakeholders and decision makers and, and, and visioners in the way the way the, the movement is moving. And that, I loved hearing you say that because that's something we work on every day, how to bridge that gap. And we, we're, we're starting to be a little bit successful. That's part of the purpose of this channel in order to you know, make those connections. So I really appreciate that. So I'm going to, you've been with us for an hour and a half. God love you, man, because I, I, I know I ask a lot of questions, but I'm so grateful that you took the time and energy out to sure. spend it with us. It was wonderful. Well, it's been a pleasure. Hello to everyone out there. It's, it's a, the support and the love is, is appreciated. And, you know, I don't know what I don't know anything else to say. You're getting a lot of love and best wishes, and and we hope that you will um, keep in touch with us and let us know how we can help you out in your your future challenges. And we look forward to seeing you raising hell down in LA and getting those well, people. I, guess, I can give you my my email address. I mean, if people want to contact me by email, I mean they can. Um, I get eight zillion emails because I'm on all these like listservs from OWS and Mayday <laughs> and all this stuff. And so, yeah, I don't know what how to say. I don't know what to say. Can come up with something that they can say where I know it's coming from this so I know to look at. Yeah, we'll, we'll put, yeah, we'll put a header it. a header in it, and we'll we'll be glad to um, post your email address if you want to, or you know, we yeah. can we can help. We can work on that. Sue, do you think we'll facilitate it somehow? We'll be in touch on that, and that way we sure. can help you. Um, but this is my uh, my chance to uh, thank all the Alphabet agencies that are watching us tonight. We love you guys. You don't know it, but you're part of the 99%. The NSA, CIA, DHS, FBI, blah, blah, blah. We know you watch, and we're glad to have you here. I want to give a special shout out to um, Overcome Greed and Mr. Overcome Greed for helping facilitate this. Also, Hand to Mouth, a good friend of ours that um, has helped connect us with Billy. It was through them that we were able to get this to happen. So thank those guys. And I know they, they might be right around the corner listening, so give them my best. Um, Tell, tell Overcome Greed <laughs> that, that Gary says hi to their dog. Um, also want to thank the OPM production hi, team. <laughs> hi, Over. How are you? <laughs> I want to thank the OPM production team for making this possible. That's Sue's that facilitated tonight. Zena, clearly. And our good friend Uppity, who's taken the night off. Apparently, I've been accused within the uh, OPM production teams of, of being a little bit of an obsessive compulsive slave driver, but I'm really not. We just try to give a good show for you guys. And um, thank you again, Billy. We wish you well. Sure. We wish you rapidly improving health and good wishes. And thank you again so much for being here. So um, I'm going to let you go for, for now, and then I'm going to stay on and talk with these guys a little bit and give them updates on the calendars and stuff like that. So safe okay. travels. We love you, man. Thank you for everything you're doing for us. Have a good night.